Okay, so here is the discussion of a follow-up on testing. So more testing. This time we're going to talk about white and black box testing. So once again, I want to point out that there is some material on debugging, which is related to testing, in Chapter 6 of the Stormy Attaway textbook. So please have a look at Chapter 6, particularly 6.5 in the Stormy Attaway text. So once again, I always want to emphasize this, mistakes are normal. They happen all the time, and it's important that when you develop systems, whether it's a programmed system, or it's a mechanical system, or a civil engineering application, assume that there will be mistakes in the development or implementation of your device, your system, etc., and plan for that. Plan for the possibility of mistakes. Okay, so let's talk about the first of the two types of testing methods. In this case, white box testing. So white box testing tests the internal structure and logic of code. Um, and in order to perform white box testing, you must have knowledge of how the code has been implemented. So typically what we're talking about is the developer or somebody related to the developer who is working with internal knowledge of what's going on inside of the particular system, the particular piece of code. So when you're doing white box testing, you're trying to do things like ensuring that every statement, every branch of an if else if statement, every for loop iteration, um, etc., is being tested. So every possibility, every variation of the code itself is being tested, that every logical expression inside of the code is being tested to see whether or not it acts uh, properly when um, used with true and false conditions. Okay, so that basically every possible option in your code is being tested. Let's uh, look at an example. So let's imagine that you are writing a function that returns the value true or one. If a point uh, made up of an x and y coordinate is strictly inside of a circle, okay, so this circle right here that we're talking about, okay, um, centered on zero and zero, and having a radius like this, r. I should probably make it a lowercase r, like that. The function returns false otherwise. So if it's on the outside, basically, we want it to return false. And consider the following implementation, and I'm going to have some errors in here, and we're going to go through what happens with each one of the error stages. But basically, you got a circle, you want to see uh, what happens if you've got a test condition for inside versus outside. So here's the MATLAB function. It's called is inside. Okay. And um, basically, you've got the output there. You got the function name there. You have two inputs, P and R. And P is made up of a vector of values P1 and P2. P1 is the x coordinate, and P2 is the y coordinate. Then we have some equation right here that's x squared plus y squared, basically what we infer is a circle equation. And then there's an if condition, a conditional statement, uh, that's taking a look to see uh, whether the result of this circle equation is greater than the radius, r, right? r was up here, and so we're testing to see if r uh, what R is with respect to this circle equation answer S. And then, depending on that, then we output some uh, statement, some value, true being 1, to the variable in, which gets returned by the function at the end. So, we do a test. So this is the white box testing. Okay, So we're testing how this function works. So we take a point, x value is 50, y value is 0. And, um, and so we've got this radius of 1 for the circle. So the circle is defined with a radius of 1. We want to test the point, the xy point, of 50 and 0. And we want to say, or we want to test to see whether it's on the inside or the outside of a circle with radius 1. So we run this code, and the value for in, which is the output of this particular function, returns 1 or true. Okay. 
So basically, um, yes, it's returned true like that. Now that doesn't make any sense. So we need to change it. So we update the code and we add in or change the code that's inside of that if statement. We change it to be in is equal to false if the s value is greater than r the radius. Okay, so that's, we've made that change. So we make that change. Now we retry the test. We keep the same uh, x and y coordinates, 50 and 0, and we are going to test for that point, 50 and 0, with a circle of radius 1. So we're doing a comparison between that point and the circle that is defined with the radius of 1. And we do that, and we get an output to this function of false, which is the correct answer. Because 50 and 0 is outside of a circle of radius 1. Okay, now we try a second basic test. And so we're going to test to see if the point 0 and 0 is inside of the circle of radius 1. So we're testing to see if the origin uh, of the circle is inside of a circle of radius 1. And intuitively, we should be answering, yes, of course, this is the case. Because you're smart and you're like an oracle. You know what this, what's going on here. Okay, you're an expert in circles. And um, so we, we run this code and we say in is equal to is inside. So that's the function. That's the output. And we put the origin in here and we test it against a circle of radius 1. And we get an error. We get an error. Why? Why would we getting? Why would we get an error at all? At all? There shouldn't be an error. But we have to inspect the code to see why. What is going on here? So we've got the function like this, and we take a look um, at the code, and we realize that it doesn't have a default condition. That there are possibilities where s uh, wouldn't be greater than r and therefore this statement wouldn't engage, that there would be no actual defined value for in. So we add in a statement at the very end of here, of that conditional statement, saying in is equal to true, because what we want is basically, we want a default statement, right? So we put this in here and we run some tests. And so we do this uh, test and we run it, so for the origin, and we've got a radius of 1, and the output of this function is now 1. It's true. Okay, so we are really happy with that. Great. So we're going to retry the first test again. So we retry. We've made some significant changes to the code. We want to test again uh, that first condition. So we've got an x and y value of 50 and 0. We have a radius of 1. Okay, so that's what we're going to test on. And we do this test of 50 and 0 versus a radius of one circle, okay, and we get an input, or sorry, we get um, an output to this function, okay, which is the answer, is it in the circle, and um, and we get this, in, this, this output of one. So we're being told that the point 50 and 0 is true when there's a radius of 1 on the circle. And, and that answer is wrong, okay? It should be 0. It should be false. So we didn't get the expected output, so we have to look at the code again. And it turns out that we put this in is equal to true at the wrong place. What we should have done is had a slightly more complicated conditional statement. And that slightly more complicated conditional statement should be a two-parter. There should be the first one that says s is greater than r, so we're testing the radius, and, and if it... Um, if it is true, then we want to be saying that the, the condition is false. But otherwise, we want to say that the condition is true. So we want an if-else statement here. And that should help us out. Okay, so we would need the second option. We need it to be the default in the event that s is not uh, greater than r. Okay, now, so we're going to retry the two cases. So we do our first test and we test for 50 and 0 as a point against a radius of one circle and we get false. Alright, we like that. 
we do another test for the origin. So 0 and 0 versus a radius of 1. It is inside of the circle of radius 1. We like that. Okay, that's true. And uh, so our two tests both yield the expected output. So we've had success here. Great. All right, but we're not done. The original problem statement contained the following um, additional condition. A point exactly on the perimeter of the circle should not be considered as being strictly inside of the circle. So we want to reject it if it's on the perimeter. And that's effectively the, the really, really thin line at the edge of the circle. So we need to test this condition as well. So let's use the fact that a point on the circle with a radius of 1 can be written as sine of theta cos of theta. All right, and that gives us our x and y values. So let's choose uh, theta is equal to 8 degrees, and we'll be able to test, we could actually test for a whole lot of these along the perimeter. So we've chosen theta is equal to uh, 8 degrees. We're going to define our x and y values as sine theta and cos theta. And we're going to use the uh, degree versions of the sine and cos functions. Okay. So we're using sine d and cos d. So we don't have to convert to radians. And we run these tests. Okay. So we run the test and we evaluate um, these conditions. But we have to remember that now the, the output of sine d and cos d is going to be a floating point number. Okay. And a floating point number is effectively a number with a decimal point in it. decimal point number. And so we get an answer of zero or false, which is the expected answer, which is great. Except that if we try and do it with whole numbers, so one and zero, which is also on the perimeter, okay, we get an answer of true, which is a failed condition. Okay, so that shouldn't have happened. So we've got contradictory uh, information or, or results based on the difference between a floating point number and an integer or whole number. Oh boy. Okay, so it's important to, po important to point out that in MATLAB um, you can have surprises like this when you deal with numbers that are floating point numbers or decimal numbers um, versus integer numbers or whole numbers. So for instance, if you were to test the conditionality of, or the condition for trueness between 0 0.3 and 0.1.1 and 0.1 added together, which is true, okay, that, that should be effectively the same. 0 0.1, 0 0.1, and 0 0.1 together makes 0 0.3, and that should be equal to 0 0.3, but look, it says it's false. Oh, that's not true. Okay, how about this? 3 multiplied by 0 0.1 is greater than 0.3. Um, we check that out. Well, that should be false, right? Because it's not greater than 0.3. But the answer is 1, which means it's true, which isn't right. It's a lie. Okay, so these two answers are lies. They're not right. Or at least from my interpretation, they're, they're not right. Um, and then if we do sine of pi, is, is it equal to 0? Well, if you think about your basic trig functions, um, that should be true but we get a false answer, okay? Which is not true either. So MATLAB is lying to us, um, and that's disconcerting. But it takes a little bit of insight, insight to determine why that's going on, all right? But it's important to point out that sometimes, if you're using floating point numbers, the answers won't be exactly like you're assuming, all right? So in this particular case, the reasons why we were getting answers in our code that weren't quite right is because we were actually needing to put in a different version of the if conditional statement. So what we wanted, instead of s is greater than r, we wanted s is greater than or equal to r. So we've changed that. Fabulous. So we've changed the inequality, and now we should have a better answer. So we um, do some testing, we find out that it actually works. Let's try something else that's a little bit different. All right, let's test the point 1.999 and 0 with a radius of 2. Okay, so in this case, we should have a point that is inside of a circle that has a radius of 2. We run the code 
and we get a false answer. All right, MATLAB has effectively lied when we've taken this floating point number, this decimal, this decimal point number, and we've run the test. Why? Why has it failed? So yet again, we've had a problem. Well, that's because we didn't write our math quite right. It turns out that what we are really testing for, or should be testing for, is r squared. And the reason is because r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. So r should be tested versus the square root of x squared plus y squared. Or r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared is the test we should be doing. That's effectively what we should be doing in here. That's the, the test we should be doing. So with that modification of the code, everything should be okay now, and we get an answer of true. Okay, so that's good. We're fantastic on that. Okay, so I hope that what we've conveyed here is that um, when you do this white box kind of testing, there's a whole multitude of tests that you have to do. And sometimes if you're not rigorous enough with the types of tests or the number of tests that you've done, the variety of tests, you might not uncover the errors that you're looking for. So we want to note that uh, testing like this doesn't prove correctness. What it does is uncover errors, but there's no guarantee that this sort of testing will uncover all errors. That's important to point out. So um, the sort of test that we just did wouldn't necessarily uncover this kind of problem where inside of our code we've mixed up x and y with respect to the values that are being input by the user the results will be correct but the fact is that we have introduced an error in here that for the most part won't get picked up it's still wrong but it won't get picked up by uh, the white box testing that we were talking about okay so what sort of other testing could you possibly do well it turns out that if you don't have internal access or developer level access to the code, you result or have to um, uh, resort to black box testing. Okay, and this is a very common type of testing. It's um, it ignores the implementation details and only examines what the code does in response to inputs and running conditions. So it's not as rigorous as the white box testing. It's more behavioral. Okay, this is behavioral testing. Um, it doesn't require knowledge or access to the source code. And so as a user of, of a particular program, you can test for this sort of thing. Um, but it does in the end focus on, on whether or not the program itself is behaving like it should. There are all sorts of people that work on this kind of thing, on black box testing. Uh, video game testing is often uh, one of the classic ways of, of thinking of black box testing. And, uh, and it's important to do because games, as well as other sort of software, can be buggy. So here we've, uh, we've uh, taken a look at both white box testing and black box testing. Black box testing sort of in, in an overview kind of way. Um, but uh, but these are the types of testing that you can expect to do not only in software, but you would also have to do this kind of testing in a civil engineering application or mechanical engineering application or geomatics application as well. Um, the sort of uh, testing regimes would be slightly different for non-software kind of applications, but the rigor um, would be similar.